I really believe that creative people need space. They need freedom. Um, if you, you know, and that's not only true, I think, in our industry. This is, this is true everywhere. Uh, if you would ask an artist uh, what, what, what kind of environment an artist would need to, to be creative, and I have such discussions with, with, with them, uh, at some point they would talk about freedom. Um, and not having constraints. Uh, I, I think that is very, very important. And uh, in an environment like ours, what that means is that you really have to uh, delegate decision making as much as you can. I, I personally believe that autonomous smaller units work better than very centralized big organizations. Uh, so those are kind of um, elements which, which you can influence. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think it has a lot to do with, with courage. I mean, if you go for something new, uh, if you try something new, the risk of failure is huge. Uh, I mean, more often than not, you will not succeed. So if you have a culture where failure is a problem, uh, then you don't get innovation. Um, so it's not only about giving people the freedom uh, to create something new, it's also about accepting failure. I, I would go so far and, uh, and I'd say sometimes you even have to celebrate failure. Because if you celebrate failure, it signals to the people that it's okay to fail and that it's part of, 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 of true innovation. I think there is also uh, a change happening uh, in Switzerland. And I should also say at the end of the day, there's a lot of innovation coming from Switzerland. There's a lot of innovation also coming from Japan. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of innovation coming from the US. If you are a global uh, company like, our, like, like us, um, I think what is important is that you um, preserve the culture, which can be very different in different places. If you, if you would enter a research facility in Tokyo, for example, um, uh, or in San Francisco or here in Basel, you would immediately, you just enter the, the place and you would, would feel a different atmosphere uh, because it reflects the respective environment uh, at, at, at the location. And, and I think innovation is also about uh, enabling this kind of diversity, right? Because there is a diversity of thinking. Uh, I mean, the Japanese look at the same problem in a very different way um, than the Americans, and, and, and the same is true for, for people in Switzerland. And by looking at the same problem from different perspectives, I think eventually you also enhance uh, the chances uh, of innovation, because from the get-go, you don't know really what is working. Uh, so, so you have to allow for that diversity. And cultural diversity, I think, also enhances this uh, diversity of thinking. Uh, to give you an example, in, in, in Japan, uh, there was a, a molecule developed, um, uh, a so-called antibody, right? Um, and it didn't work out the first time. And in that center, they had such a stamina, you know, they were convinced that eventually this will work. And I think they developed 10,000 different molecules and they tried over and over and over and over again. And eventually they got the right molecule and, and it worked. And it's today a very important uh, medicine uh, for hemophilia patients. Now, I, I once talked with our research head in, in, in the US and I said, you know, what do you think about this molecule? And what he said to me, this would never have worked in the US because in, in the US, the culture would be if you try something kind of over and over again, that's, and it doesn't work, that's kind of the definition of stupidity, right? Uh, people would challenge you and would say, give it another uh, approach uh, uh, to, to be successful. Um, and, and in Japan, you know, there's this enormous stamina, right? If they are convinced that, that, that it could work, they, they keep, you know, working on that uh, and, and, and try to optimize, etc. cetera. Um, and, and it shows you, right, that uh, uh, we probably would never have been able uh, to develop a molecule like this in the United States or if we had tried to kind of uh, enforce a culture which is more adequate for the states uh, into the Japanese uh, uh, setting and the other way around. So, so I, I think there is something about 
um, you know, it's, 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 it's respecting the culture, respecting this diversity, which helps you to be innovative. So why is it um, an attractive location? Um, first and foremost, uh, we can attract uh, great people to Switzerland, right? There is uh, very qualified people in Switzerland. We have very renowned academic institutions. Uh, there is good research ongoing and, and all of that attracts the best talent of the world. And we can tap into this talent pool. So if you look at the big clusters, the big centers around the world where, where pharmaceutical research and development happens, it's typically at places um, where you have great universities, a great healthcare infrastructure, you know, all the healthcare infrastructure to do clinical trials, um, because that attracts the people. And then as a result of it, you know, uh, that's where, where, where companies can actually do their work. Um, and, and in these clusters, uh, it's, it's, it's really about, you know, this, it's almost an interdependence, right, uh, which, which makes these clusters successful. If universities, you have, you have uh, startup companies, you have big companies, uh, you have venture capitalists who, who finance uh, the system, etc. So, so that is what, 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 what really matters. And, and um, uh, Switzerland, uh, you know, is, is very attractive here. Here we find the best people in their respective disciplines. They are working on cutting-edge projects, and that's why we collaborate with them. Um, and that, that's really it at, at, at the very core. It's about talent, it's about people, it's about cutting-edge research, which is done in other companies, in academic institutions, at universities. Um, and that is where the collaboration typically starts, right? It's typically two or three people who know each other, who work on the same problem, and kind of then bigger collaborations uh, come from that, and startup companies, spin-offs might come from that, and again, we work with these spin-off companies, perhaps we are a company which we also did in Switzerland uh, uh, and that is how, how, how it gets mutually beneficial but at the very core of it is uh, the best talent in the world which, which attracts us to those uh, uh, institutions. There is one, one uh, big concern I have and that is that healthcare um, and the industry as a whole is getting more and more digital and more and more relies um, on big data, healthcare data. And that's a big weakness um, in, in, in Switzerland. We are lagging behind here. Uh, we are very good in the traditional, let me call it more analog uh, uh, disciplines like biology, chemistry, engineering. And all those disciplines will remain very important. But increasingly, um, this is converging with uh, digital capabilities, right? Uh, to analyze big data sets, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. cetera. Um, and, and here Switzerland is lagging behind, uh, uh, specifically in the healthcare system, because we don't have access to big data here in Switzerland. And as a result of it, we cannot always do the research we want to do as these disciplines are converging. And as a result of it, a number of projects are, uh, you know, going to the US uh, projects, which in the past would have landed in Switzerland. And increasingly, we see some of those projects uh, going uh, to, to China as well. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned uh, about uh, Switzerland losing ground um, uh, with the digitalization of healthcare. I give you a very specific example. So if you talk with a hospital today, right? And you say, can we work with what we call real-world data? So this is patient data which are collected in the clinical practice, right? Um, so typically what we do is we, we have clinical trials where we have very kind of artificial environments and limited data. That is possible in Switzerland. But if we want to go into the clinical practice, right, and we want to say kind of all the data which are collected on a daily basis in clinical practice, we want to bring them together, we want to aggregate this data, and we want to analyze the data, right? 
then a hospital would turn around and would say, yeah, actually it makes a lot of sense. I have a lot of understanding. It would help us to improve healthcare delivery. It would help us to uh, drive collaborations with the industry, but I don't touch the hot uh, potato. I'm afraid of touching that. If you talk privately with people, they say it would be the right thing, but I don't touch it. If you talk with politicians, the same thing, right? So there is fear of dealing with patient data. And as a result of it, we miss the opportunities. Now, data privacy, data security, in particular in healthcare, is extremely important. But what people kind of miss a bit, and again, that's my lack of uh, communication ability to, to bring it across, is that, um, uh, first of all, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has been dealing with patient data in the, in the, in the, with clinical trials for decades, in the case of Roche, for 100 years. It's a very regulated environment and, you know, you can have a lot of criticism about the pharmaceutical industry. I've never heard that the pharmaceutical industry was not dealing responsibly with data. Data privacy was never an issue in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, even though we deal with a lot of data in the context of clinical trials. So there are uh, possibilities to deal with patient data uh, in, in a safe way. And the second element which people miss, uh, mix up is that in our industry, it's only about aggregated, anonymized, de-identified data, right? This is very different to the consumer industry where you have tech companies who want to come back to the individual IP address because they do the personalized advertising for this individualized IP address. We are not interested in this. If you develop a medicine, all you need is aggregated patient data which tell you uh, for what kind of patients in an aggregated way a certain medicine would work or not work or where you would have side effects. And it's so difficult to communicate uh, to a broader audience the difference between identified data and de-identified data. We only are interested in de-identified data. Underlying is a lack of trust, right? That's, that's the problem. We depend still on great biologists. We depend on chemists. We depend on engineers. We depend on other expertise, like in the past. But we are employing literally thousands of people today who have a digital background, data scientists, uh, uh, people who can code, right? Uh, uh, people who are really deep experts in these new upcoming capabilities which get crucial for us. It's already happening, you know? This is that the problem is that most of these people sit in the United States. You know, over the last couple of years, we have uh, recruited literally thousands of people at the East Coast uh, in, in, in the United States. Why? partly because we get the talent there, but above all, because we can implement projects there. We can work with the people uh, on specific uh, research and development uh, projects and, and, and new businesses. We also did acquisitions there, right? We couldn't do these acquisitions in, 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 in uh, Switzerland because there are no such companies, not a single one, right? Um, and as a result of it, what is happening in these new areas, inevitably, there's a shift away from Switzerland to other locations. Today, it's mainly the United States, and increasingly what we see is uh, that uh, China is, 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 is catching up in this field. I mean, it's really a big issue. Uh, it's a big issue. And you know what, what, what the dangerous thing of it is? Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, right? It happens in a slow way. This is a project which goes somewhere else, there's another project which goes somewhere else, and then suddenly what you see is the relative share of the activities in Switzerland is coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. And this happens over a couple of years, and then you look back and then suddenly a big portion of it has gone, right? And if you then spin it further, I don't want to panic, but, but I think the danger is real. If you believe in what we believe, that those disciplines will have uh, to work together and they will get very interdependent, then what you have is you are not only losing the opportunities in the new field, you also have spillover effects into the traditional strengths of Switzerland. Because if you have, uh, you know, projects where a biologist, a chemist and a data scientist have to work together, um, and then suddenly in Switzerland it's not the right place anymore to do the data side, you know what? then suddenly there will also be less work for the biologist and, and, and the chemist because the projects are gone. So not only do you not participate in the new fields which are uh, up and coming, 
On top of it, in the long term, you endanger what is already here today. Uh, so this is really, really a big issue. The first thing we have to do, and I'm talking now about healthcare data, right, is that we have an obligatory uh, patient record, right? I mean, uh, in, in a standardized way. Um, I tell you what the US did, uh, and which turned out to be very successful. So, so, you know, we just have to look around what other countries are doing, and, and I would just simply copy what they did. So in the US, what they did is for the public healthcare system, there is a, a system called Medicare, Medicaid, which is for people over a certain age and, and, and so on. And uh, what, what the Obama administration did a long time ago already, they said, if you want to be reimbursed for uh, you know, all the medical services in an in a, in a institution, um, and in the US this is primarily private institutions, but if you want to re be reimbursed right, for, for those healthcare services, you have to provide me data in a standardized format. You have to provide me with patient data, what has been the diagnosis, what has been the treatment, what has been the outcome, in a standardized form, right? And then you get reimbursed for the service. And if you don't deliver me the data in this standardized form, you don't get money. Then collect your money yourself from your private patients, but don't come to me as a state. As a minimum, what I request from you is if I give you money, if I give you taxpayers' money, if I give you public money, then I want everything on an pl electronic platform, right? Now, what that triggered was, via the back door, if you like, um, uh, an electronic health record. Because if a hospital or uh, another medical institution was not able to deliver this data in a standardized form, right, they didn't get any money more anymore. They were bankrupt, right? So what happened is that literally, when, when, when the, you know, there was a transition time, but at that date, everybody delivered this kind of data. And as a result of it, you had standardized digital data. And on the basis of that, a whole industry developed. Uh, lots of companies developed, who, uh, uh, private companies who, who, who kind of looked at the data, developed insights, improved the data, improved the quality, uh, monetizing the data, for example, with the life science industry. And we, as a result of it, had a whole ecosystem where we could engage. We also did acquisitions. So we have a business now in the United States on the basis of this kind of standardized data. So the, the first and most basic step would be to have a true electronic health record, which is obligatory, of course, anonymized, uh, de-identified data uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and these kind of data, uh, you know, have to be provided. So what we do um, uh, as a company and here in Switzerland is when we have upscaling, when we have new technologies, we keep them in-house uh, and we actually have them here in Switzerland, right? Because here it's less about the cost. Here it's about the talent, the expertise, the know-how to bring such technologies uh, to the right level. I think it would be counterproductive to try to subsidize uh, production here in Switzerland or artificially keep some production here in the country. You know, we, 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 are, we, are, we are just kind of wasting resources and money uh, because uh, that's not something what we should do in, in Switzerland. By the way, if I look back over the last decades, the kind of low-level production which we originally had in Switzerland, like packaging, routine packaging, I mean, this has all gone. 100% it's out of Switzerland. It's too expensive here and it's a waste of resources. And I think it would be completely wrong from a, from a government point of view to start to subsidize these kind of activities. Where the government should, should take care of it is basic research. That's where, where, where the, the industry uh, typically doesn't have the time horizon uh, to, to invest into. But it's exactly this basic research which attracts the best people from the world, right? Uh, and that again, if the best people then are in Switzerland, uh, then again, this attracts the industry uh, to, to put all these ideas into uh, applied research uh, and into innovations like medicines or diagnostics in, in, in our case. So uh, I think it's always been a strength, by the way, of Switzerland, that Switzerland has not subsidized old industries. 
Uh, a lot of other countries in Europe in particular try to hang on to stuff which is already obsolete and which should go somewhere else. Switzerland uh, has a liberal uh, economy here uh, and has focused research on basic research. Uh, the fact that we have uh, well-funded uh, uh, universities uh, and the, the uh, ETH in particular, uh, I think is a huge strength of Switzerland and a lot of that money is going into basic research. That's, that's where we should invest, but not in some kind of old manufacturing technologies. Uh, that's, that's completely counterproductive. If I look at uh, what has happened over the last um, year uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, what we have seen is an increased level of partnerships within the industry and very importantly, partnerships with regulatory authorities have come to a completely different level. Um, in, in our industry, traditionally, what you would do is a clinical trial. You collect the data, you analyze the data, then you put together your file, right? Then you send the file to the authorities, the authorities look at it, they come back to you with questions, then you answer the questions, they come back with you with new questions, you answer the questions, and then typically after perhaps two or three years, uh, the respective product is approved, right? That's, that's what we face today. Um, and I should say, uh, Europe is, is even slower than, uh, than the United States. It takes typically at least one year more uh, until an approval for a medicine is granted in, in Europe and also in Switzerland. Now, what we have seen with, with COVID-19 is what we call uh, rolling filing, right? So the data come in and we have immediately shared the data uh, with the authorities, not having ad ad analyzed ourselves yet, right? Um, and uh, uh, so, so the authorities got the data, we got the data, and we were already discussing the data, right? So at the time when, when all the data uh, have been collected, the authorities and the, the, the company was at the same information level, right? And as a result of it, a decision of whether to approve a product or not uh, on a so-called accelerated basis could be made very fast. So something which in the past took years, now suddenly took weeks or even days, right? Uh, and that is a big learning. If you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said it's impossible. I mean, literally, I would have said it's impossible. And, and I'm sure if I would have talked with, if you would have talked with regulators, they would have given you also a thousand reasons why this is impossible. Now we know it's possible. And it makes a big difference. Because why should we not kind of adapt such processes for other life-saving uh, medicines? You know, if you have a new cancer medicine which saves life, why should you not kind of apply the same methodologies to bring such innovations as fast as possible uh, to, to patients? And now with COVID, we know that it's possible. I really have to say, uh, uh, the, the collaboration uh, was excellent. Uh, I really have to say it was excellent. So, so now we have to keep that momentum. We have to learn from that. We, we have to not fall back into the kind of old habits um, on both sides. Um, I mean, uh, uh, that's, that's not only the case for the regulatory authorities. Also, we had to adapt our processes massively and, and we have to make sure that we keep this momentum. By the way, the other thing, if we talk about COVID-19, the other thing which I would hope for is that now finally this digitalization gets a little bit more momentum, right? Uh, I mean, we have all experienced uh, the downsides of not having data uh, available uh, on our fingertips uh, and sending them around on, on fax paper even uh, and not being able to, um, you know, uh, uh, get uh, standardized analysis out of the data, which would have helped us enormously to, in the fight uh, uh, against this pandemic. Um, so uh, hopefully with, with, with that experience, even though here it was a negative experience, right, uh, that has also a lasting impact in terms of people waking up and, and seeing the potential of it uh, uh, for, for healthcare in the first place, but also to, to remain an attractive location for the life science industry.